From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. I'm Chelsea Judge with the Connor B. Judge Foundation. On our last episode, we talked about pregnancy considerations in those with NMO, and now relatedly, we're going to talk about the postpartum period and what patients with NMO may need to consider. And this is very heavy on female perspectives, but NMO does overwhelmingly affect females at up to a ratio of 9 to 1. Once again on the podcast, I'm delighted to have Dr. Tamara Kaplan and Dr. Kristen Galetta, both practicing neurologists at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, and associated with Harvard Medical School. The clinicians are going to talk about the potential risk of relapse post-pregnancy and really emphasizing the need for planning maintenance therapy with your clinical team, including your neurologist and OBGYN. We're going to dive into breastfeeding, some misconceptions that surround the area, as well as the stigma that many women have in choosing whether or not to breastfeed, and then dive into important safety considerations regarding maintenance therapies and breastfeeding. We'll talk some bit, a bit about NMO symptoms and parenting and how to manage that, including postpartum depression. We'll also touch upon the importance and the t- the importance of having a strong caregiver or support team, including a partner, um, spouse, family member, etc. And then Drs. Kaplan and Dr. Galetta will talk with us about the heritability of NMO. I hope you find this interesting. I certainly did. Hello again, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Galetta. Thank you so much for being with us here. Last episode, we covered the importance of timing in choosing a treatment to help potentially manage any future relapses post-pregnancy in that postpartum period. I think a big topic that comes up just naturally then is once you've chosen your specific DMT to help prevent future disease activity is maybe breastfeeding and the potential implications there. So what are your guys' thoughts or concerns overall? But so breastfeeding, is it is it protective? It's really not known. And even the data really in MS a little bit missed, mm-hmm. um, which maybe a suggestion that it could be protective, but certainly wouldn't replace a disease-modifying therapy even in that case. We really don't have enough information to comment either way on NMO. But again, uh, breastfeeding itself should not replace disease-modifying therapy for either disease. Okay, something that, you know, if you choose to do, you're doing that in addition to your DMT, not on its own. Right, okay. exactly. You know, and some women may make the decision to go on a DMT and not breastfeed, and, and that's okay, too, because there's a lot of stigma mm-hmm. around breastfeeding, and a lot of women feel an extreme sense of pressure to breastfeed. And for a lot of women, it doesn't work for various reasons, because of issues with the mother or with the baby, and women shouldn't feel bad about that decision. The most important thing is that the baby's fed and that the mom is healthy, and however that happens is what's most important. I think it's so important that you say that because, like you said, there is a lot of stigma around that. And if a woman chooses to, that's great. But also, you know, the best thing, right, is for the mo- the baby to be fed and also for the mom to be healthy to take care of that baby. Absolutely. When a woman who has NMO and she's now chosen a specific DMT, is there, and she does want to breastfeed or she's considering breastfeeding, is there anything that they should think about regarding safety? Yeah, well, we can actually talk about a few of the different disease-modifying therapies and what we do know about breastfeeding. Unfortunately, for a lot of these medications, there isn't a lot of data because, and this is true for everything with breastfeeding, you know, there's just not a lot of randomized controlled um, Mm -hmm. trials. But starting just with steroids, since we mentioned that postpartum relapses can occur and patients may be treated with steroids, lactation is completely compatible with steroid use. And that's really important to know. Some women have been advised to pump and dump, Mm -hmm. and we don't actually think that that's necessary. When we talk about any of these medications, we think about what's called the relative infant dose or the RID. And we think with steroids, with methylprednisolone, it's about 0.7% after someone has received steroids. And the limit of what's acceptable Mm -hmm. um, for an RID for any medication is about 10%. Oh, wow. You know, 10 times lower than what would be acceptable. We do sometimes advise women to just wait several hours before they breastfeed again because that will further decrease the dose of or the amount of steroid in in the milk. But there there should be no concerns about breastfeeding and use of steroids. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, azocyprine is another medication that's commonly used in NMO, and we also think that this medication is relatively safe. There, there has only been a few case reports of, of women who've used this medication, but it seems, again, that the amount that actually gets into the milk is very, very low, and is thought to be safe with breastfeeding. Okay, great. And then any others that we have information on? Yeah, that's methylphenolate. Um, you know, it's commonly used with NMO. We are not actually even sure whether or not that passes into the breast milk. So one small study of patients did show that patients on um, methylphenolate didn't have any adverse effects, but generally speaking, we don't have enough information to say either way. So okay. the clinician and, and patient partner would probably make that decision about the risks and benefits individually. And similarly, methotrexate, which I think we got into a lot in the last podcast about sort of the dangers of being pregnant while taking methotrexate, there's actually not that much information about it either um, and really mixed feelings about whether or not it's safe. Although, going back to what Dr. Kaplan said about the relative infant dose, if a patient takes methotrexate, that usually actually the peak um, dose is around 10 hours, and mm-hmm. that peak was actually 0.08 in studies of of, um, breast, of of patients who were taking methotrexate in their breast milk. So that would suggest that the concentration is pretty low and the amount that the infant is getting is pretty low. At the same time, because this is kind of a risky medication, I think people are very careful about it. So this is, again, one of those uh, patient-provider conversations. Steroids and azathioprine, there's more clear-cut data available indicating low risk overall or low exposure, but when it comes to methotrexate and mycophenolate, it's it's a bit blurry. And I think one, one of the other points that Dr. Galetta sort of is alluding to, too, is that, you know, we talked a lot about in the previous podcast about how methotrexate is really dangerous during pregnancy, mm-hmm. but the side effects of one medication during pregnancy can be really different than the side effects or, or the effects of, during uh, lactation. Mm. So, you know, things can have their own consequences, but they might be very different. And there are certain medications that are not safe in pregnancy, but may be okay during breastfeeding. Exactly. And that has to sort of do with just the way molecules potentially pass, whether or not they do or don't pass into the breast milk. How, and that depends on how big they are and, and then also what, those, what the effects of the medication are and whether or not it even can survive in a, like a, a newborn gut. So there's a lot of details in there. So is it reasonable then that you as a clinician with your patient with NMO um, might choose a, one protect, particular treatment during pregnancy and then switch postpartum? That would probably depend partially, I, like as is the theme, on what the patient's disease activity was mm-hmm. prior okay. and, and thinking about what their risk would be of relapsing after. I think that we both sort of discussed the importance of just making sure mom is healthy. So I think that that would be our number one priority. Of course, we want to honor patients' wishes to breastfeed, but if it came down to it and we felt like a medication that maybe wasn't safe for breastfeeding was indicated, mm-hmm. we would we would certainly prioritize the mom's health. Okay, of course. Okay. And so, and, and one medication that a lot of our NMO patients are using is uh, rituximab. There's an interesting study that was just published looking at levels of rituximab in breast milk in quite a few different patients. And they found that the relative infant dose for rituximab was actually less than 0.4%, which is well below that theoretical acceptable level of 10%. And also, given that it's a monoclonal antibody, it probably would have low what we call bioavailability Mm -hmm. once it would enter into the the newborn's gut. So with all those being said, it's probably a very minimal amount that even gets transferred into the milk, and it probably wouldn't have much of an effect on the baby at all. You know, it's emerging as something that would likely be safe, but we don't have a ton of data right now. I think that although the data that's available is altogether reassuring, at least to have a conversation with a clinician about. Yes, absolutely. So after discussing breastfeeding and choosing a DMT that might be best if that is something that you as a mother want to pursue, what are other issues that NMO patients might experience that might be unique to them as parents? As you can appreciate, you know, anything that sort of stresses the nervous system or stresses out people in general, infections or fatigue can make old symptoms come back and, or at least feel like you're, you're having the old symptoms again, not necessarily having a, a relapse. So um, patients definitely can have flares of their old symptoms, although they may not be sort of a new disease activity. 
And that's, it's an important thing to think about because being a new parent is a really stressful time mm-hmm. for anyone. Um, and Dr. Galetta and I can, can tell you that not only as doctors, but as moms too. Um, and when you have it, when you bring home that newborn baby for the first time, it, that baby doesn't come with an instruction manual and suddenly you have to, you know, figure out what to do. And it can be really stressful and it can be a period of time where you're not sleeping and, you know, you can be more fatigued and, and all of these things can actually contribute to worsening NMO symptoms, as Dr. Galetta was saying. And so sometimes in, in these situations, it can be really helpful to have a, a partner mm-hmm. that can help you in these, at this time. No, I think that's really important to note and that, you know, a partner can look like anything, whether that's a spouse or, you know, a significant other or a family or close friend, um, any kind of support team that can help you get through what, what, like what you just said, which is universally a really stressful time. Absolutely. And for all new, all new mothers, I think can also appreciate that it, uh, it can be challenging emotionally mm-hmm. and postpartum depression and anxiety are really common for all new mothers. And I imagine it's especially challenging when you also have a neurologic disease and there are a lot of other things going on. You're making all of these decisions about breastfeeding, not breastfeeding, starting treatment, and and there are hormonal changes. I think we just always want to think about whenever somebody's postpartum how, how challenging that period can be and that if you do experience emotional changes, you feel down or really anxious, that you definitely talk to your care provider about that. And, and sometimes this might mean a multidisciplinary approach. You know, most patients will have an OBGYN and also have a neurologist. And hopefully, you know, people can also utilize resources like a social work or a psychiatrist in addition, because sometimes it takes a team approach to, to help tackle some of these issues. No, thank you guys for mentioning that, especially about postpartum depression. I think that it's a really important topic and we're getting a lot more light on it, again, just for all new mothers. But I could see how that you know time period could be especially stressful for women, like you said, with a serious neurological condition. Further recommendations or um, insights for patients regarding having a strong caregiver or support team? I just want to reiterate that a, a partner, as you mentioned, that, that can mean anything. That can mean a parent, that can mean a spouse, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a sibling. There's so many things that person can do to be helpful beyond, you know, just changing a diaper and giving a bottle to the baby, but helping with laundry mm-hmm. or helping prepare meals, like all those little things that just need to get done when the new mom is feeling very stressed and tired can be really helpful. And then I think a lot of people are concerned about the potential heritability of NMO. Do you have any data to address that? Do you know is that less than 3% of patients with NMO actually have a family member with NMO? So that suggests that there's a lot besides, and that, besides genetics that are really playing a role in the development of this disease. And there's probably a lot really more to do with environmental mm-hmm. and exposure factors. There may be a small percentage that's related to genetics, but we don't think that's a big part of this. Okay. So it shouldn't be that, you know, knowing that you have an NMO, there's a good chance that, you know, you've passed it on to your child. Right. That's right. Thank you guys so much for going over this information with us. Well, thank you so much for having us. And these are such important issues that I hope we were able to shed some light on. I was really grateful to have Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Galetta on this series with us covering sexual dysfunction, pregnancy, and the postpartum considerations for NMO patients. Um, They've just been a wealth of information for the NMO community. So I once again, thank you to them. On our next episode, we're going to talk about all things insurance, so the abyss of navigating the insurance world, getting healthcare coverage, managing patient access. Hope you tune in to that episode, which we will have for you on the first Monday of April. Please check us out at the SumairaFoundation.org and ConnerbyJudgeFoundation.org and give us some feedback. How are we doing? What do you want to hear? How could we do better? You can also reach us on social media, so Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We're at the Sumaya Foundation and at CBJ VNMO. Thank you.